Hello once again and welcome back to Spider-Man Dissembled. Welcome back everybody. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Today let's look at Amazing Spider-Man 565 through 567, Craven's First Hunt. This is by Mark Guggenheim and Bill Jimenez. Yay, Jimenez! I like Jimenez. I, I really do. And I'm, uh, I'm just going to say this right off the bat here. I personally really like the design on our new Craven here. I, I kind of like that that costume a lot, so or uniform or whatever you want to call it. So I'm, I'm assuming he's the guy that came up with that. And if so, kudos, two thumbs up. So I want to say Andy Lanning's inks look much, much better here over Phil Jimenez. And yay, Andy Landing. So Craven's daughter thinks Vin is Spidey, kidnaps him, puts the costume on him, and tries to chase him down. There we go. That's the super basic, basic outline of the plot. Daredevil guest stars, which is weird. Is it still Iron Fist here, or is this Matt during his dark, dark, dark era? Either way, he seems too old school, I guess, for it to be right. Yeah, this is definitely Murdoch during this point in time as Daredevil and not Iron Fist, but yeah, it does seem like, I don't know, he seems a little bit too chipper. Like, even though you said his dark, dark, dark period, it seems a little bit too chipper for him for what should be going on around this time, if I'm remembering correctly, but uh, I don't know. So maybe it's a brand new day for everyone. We start off with Spidey and Daredevil versus Fracture. I like that Daredevil hates Spider-Man. Peter's working at a comic store here, which is dumb. It's just dumb. It's just this excuse to put in little in-jokes, and they think they're so cute, and it's not cute. It's not funny. It's just stupid. Don't like it. I hate that. I really, really, really hate that. I mean, unless your book is from the get-go about satirizing or commenting upon the comics industry, then don't do that. Yeah, again, I'm totally with Michael on this. Really dislike him working in a comic store. What the heck? I don't even know. Whatever. But again, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, the last time we saw comics referenced during a comic, they seem to be very deprecating towards their readers. You know, the guy's asking Peter, like, how did you land this job if you've never even read one? And, and you know, Pete's like, I answered the ad in Craigslist because nobody wants to work at a comic store, so obviously the owner's gonna hire the only person that answers the app, you know? So it's just like, really? And then yeah, the comic guy that's there is just not very bright. It just seems to be... I don't know, if they're just trying to poke fun, it seems much more mean-spirited than maybe their intention is. I don't, I don't know, I totally did not like it though, and I'm, I'm, I hope that we never see something like that again. Peter exhibits some kind of extra human skills here, so he tells Mike, the comic shop guy whose life he's just saved, that he's a Skrull, which would explain a lot. So Vin gets framed for a shooting and put on suspension. Peter is subpoenaed to appear in court because of the Spider-Man lawsuit, because of the fact that he takes pictures of Spidey. Kind of curious to see how this plays out. Again, it seems to open up a whole can of worms with the whole Spider-Man unmasking on live television sort of thing. You would think that a court of law, somebody would think to look this up. So we'll see how that goes. Wow, totally had forgotten about the lawsuit against Spider-Man. That's been a while, hasn't it? Like six issues, give or take? Which, you know, I guess is only two months of when you're reading it as it was coming out. But again, that's just kind of one of those indications of they could never let a subplot go that long, that many issues, if this were a monthly book. So that's one of the, I guess, one of the good things maybe about, you know, doing the three times a month right now is they're able to take a subplot like that, throw it out once, and then, you know, six to eight even nine issues later come back to it. Uh, it still seems kind of like a long time to me, but there it is. Yay. I guess we'll be talking about this again. It's another six issues or so when they come back to it. Craven Jr. makes it pretty obvious to Vin that Pete must be Spider-Man. Will Vin remember? We see Spidey walking on a wall while wearing shoes, which is a new ability. It must be some sort of second mutation, I guess. So it is odd that he's well, not just odd, but very impossible that he's standing outside of Murdoch's office there while wearing shoes stuck to the wall. So as much as it pains me to say this on two different levels, because I'm not a huge Guggenheim fan, but I really like Jimenez, I'm gonna have to chalk this up to being artist error, you know, like Jimenez, just probably wasn't thinking about it. I sincerely doubt that Guggenheim had in his script, you know, and Spidey's stuck to the wall wearing shoes, you know, so it's just kind of like he's in street clothes, that's what it says. Jimenez probably just drew him in there. That's understandable. I'm really surprised editors didn't get it. You know, it's like Wacker seems pretty good about this type of thing. Well, I mean, he's a, he's a good editor, so... And that's high praise coming from me when it comes to Marvel editors, because I really don't like most of them. But I think Wacker does a good job with what he's doing, so it surprises me that this gets missed. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. We see Craven Jr. versus 
Vermin! Except for the Enforcers, I think this is the only old-school villain we've seen so far, in any real capacity. Spidey's costume is gone, because Craven Jr. has Vin dressed up in it, so Spidey borrows Daredevils. Guggenheim, for some reason, loves having Spider-Man sing. Don't really see the appeal of it myself. We get the healing powers over at FEAST mentioned again. FEAST! Daredevil, which is actually Spidey in Daredevil's costume, hanging out in public, seems like it should be a much bigger deal since everyone knows Murdoch is Daredevil now. This is, I believe, during the time of the Murdoch papers and all that follows because of that, where basically everybody thinks Matt Murdoch is Daredevil. Hey, you know what? It's a police station. There's your obligatory hooker. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There is one, because there always is one. It does not matter if it's in a movie or in a comic. If there is a visual medium where something is happening in a police station lobby, you will see a hooker. I'm just saying. You know, this idea of, like, why didn't Matt give his costume to somebody else and have them kind of go around and do stuff while he's in court or whatever it seems kind of a, an issue that maybe could have been brought up in Daredevil, <laughs> first of all. But second of all, if we're bringing it up here, it seems like it should be a bigger deal. Okay, not to get too crazily far off topic, but I swear I will drag it back into it here in a moment. But uh, I did a little bit of research on Daredevil because it's been a while since I've read stuff on him, and this is definitely not happening during the Murdoch papers. That was about two years prior, at least two years prior to this story arc. That was when Bendis was writing it. What was going on right now was Rucka and Brubaker's run. The story arc ended up being called Cruel and Unusual. At least that's how it's collected in the trade, which means at this point, in time, people do not know that Murdoch is Daredevil. So, boom, that, that kind of goes and explains what Michael had just said, which brings up another issue which are dragged back into one of these problems that we keep seeing over and over and over again in Amazing Spider-Man right now, is that means that Daredevil is a costumed vigilante, not registered in the state of New York, and he goes waltzing into a police station and nothing happens. At all. Again. You know, I'm totally not reading a lot of the other Marvel stuff during this time frame, but is anything happening with the Registration Act? I mean, aside from, like, Avengers Initiative and Thunderbolts, does anything happen with the uh, Registration Act? According to the world of Amazing Spider-Man, the answer to that is no. Little side note, as much as I've enjoyed most of the artists we've had so far, Pete still looks weird. Like, no artist can capture Pete looking like Pete. Even though Sergei Romanov, that's his name, right? Uh, Craven was very strongly Russian. Apparently Craven Jr. is French. Tre Furier. Vermin kicks Spidey's ass and takes a chunk out of his neck, which is amusing. Okay, so right before there's the Venom Peter fight there, or right as it starts to happen, you have a little thought bubble, text box, whatever, of Peter thinking, you know, this guy nearly killed me once right after Mary Jane and I moved in together, which is one of the few indications we've had of how Peter and MJ's relationship worked after one more day. You know, obviously I think that's the most obvious thing is they weren't married, they moved in together, but I mean, this is at least a very definite in writing, boom, they were living together during this part. Also, it makes sense that Vermin kind of ends up doing a number on Pete here. Um, if I remember right, that's one of the reasons why Craven ended up capturing Vermin back during Craven's last hunt, because every time Spidey and Vermin clash, it, it's never been kind of a clean fight. Vermin always kind of, for some reason or another, if I remember correctly, always would just do a number on poor Pete before escaping or being captured. So I, I you know, I think that's just kind of indicative of their combat relationship. So Spidey Spider-Man webs up Vermin, then asks him two questions, then asks him to show him where Craven Jr. is. In 58 minutes, I presume, since his webbing takes an hour to dissolve? They've done a couple of weird things with Spidey's webbing during this story arc. Because the time that he goes to talk to Daredevil and he's wearing the webbing mask, you know, A, that would be sticking to his face. So I'm assuming he couldn't just pull it off when he was ready to, after he borrowed the costume to go to the police station and he had to sit around and wait an hour for it. Which just seems kind of, I don't know, ridiculous or silly or maybe amusing. I'd like to see a little short story of him just like huddling somewhere underneath a bridge just waiting for his webbing to dissolve in an hour before putting on the costume and the hijinks that ensue there. Spider-Man as Daredevil versus Kraven Jr. <laughs> That's our climax. Peter's excuse for the many vicious wounds on his face that he received whilst fighting right alongside Vin, who could hear him talking in his roommate's voice, etc, etc, etc. He cut himself shaving. Everybody buys it. You know, I would expect Vin to fall for the Peter cutting himself shaving thing because Vin's not very bright, but I just say that because I dislike Vin. In all honesty, you know, Vin, yeah. 
maybe, again, I think it just goes back to maybe Peter has a Batman voice when he's a Spider-Man, except for instead of being dark and rrr, maybe he's all squeaky to like when he talks. Maybe that's why it irritates people. Oh, Ben is off suspension, so forget that subplot. Oh, and the way that we get around Vin really should be knowing that Peter is Spider-Man. Spidey comes and tells Vin that he's an intentional decoy that he has out there, which makes Vin hate Spider-Man, but it's like, come on. I mean, he's a crappy cop here, seriously. Apparently, Craven Jr. is Anna Cravenoff, daughter of Sasha and Sergei. I don't really... I mean, I read Craven's Last Hunt, and that's about all that I remember of Craven. I don't really remember much at all, like, if, if any of this stuff has been brought up before at all. This might just be complete and total retconning, which is fine by me, I'm just saying. I don't remember it. The Happy Craven family, I believe, is... I don't know. I, would, I won't, don't want to use the term retconning because there's a slight difference between retconning and revelations, and I would be assuming that this is a revelation. You know, we didn't know that he had a family that liked wearing really tight black spandex. You know, at no point in time that I'm aware of, did we ever hear Craven say, I have no family? So this isn't really a retcon, it's more much just like, oh, apparently he hooked up with a French chick and at some point in time had a kid. Okay. Which isn't really the first time that they've done something like this, because during J.M. DeMattis' run with the Clone Saga stuff, I think at the very beginning of it, when we deal with some of the stuff with Chameleon, we find out that the Chameleon was, like, Kravenoff's best friend or something growing up, which I'm not 100% sure, but I'm nigh positive that that was something that was introduced after Craven had died. So, Craven apparently has a very large extended family. Oh, and, and again, there's also Craven's son that we discovered back in, like, 2006, 2007, something like that. So again, there's a lot of precedence for this. Apparently, Craven had a very large extended Craven family. Their barbecues were probably pretty interesting. And Vermin is the Cravenoff's prisoner now. What a vermin! What a vermin! All right, as a correction, I don't believe that the revelation about Chameleon and Craven happened during the clone stuff. I think my brain was completely glitching there. It happened earlier than that, but I'm pretty sure it was still Dematis that did it during his spectacular Spider-Man run. Again, in the story, we see Guggenheim focus more on Spidey, less on Peter, and again, it works. Just a couple of wrapping up thoughts here on Craven's first hunt storyline. Okay, so it's kind of frustrating because I actually do like the new Craven. Craven Jr. is my keeps calling her. Like, her approach to the hunt is, th there's just enough reminiscent stuff of the old Craven that I really dug it, but the problem is, is she kind of ends up being, because she goes after Vin, and she's just very single-minded as being like, I don't know if you have to take a spider serum every 24 hours or something like that. It's like, she's really smart about the hunt, and then once she actually has her prey, she becomes a moron because she's like, oh, well, obviously this dude is Spider-Man because he totally acts like him. You know, I mean, she's been watching him for days, watching his moves, the way that he does things, and she's not able to tell that the way Vin is moving is not Spider-Man. So it's just like, once she gets there, she's just totally kind of clown shoes. Like, dangerous and scary and blah blah blah, but just really, honestly, not that bright. And I guess maybe it makes sense once you, you know, it's revealed that she's the, you know, young daughter, and, you know, I guess she just wasn't thinking all the way through, but at the same time, it's just kind of like, really? Really? You didn't... You, you couldn't tell at all that it wasn't Spider-Man? That seems kind of, uh... The other problem I had with it is a personal problem in the sense of I don't like Vin, so at no point in time was I like, I hope Peter rescues Vin because Vin's got such bad luck or, you know, he's such a lovable character and I want him rescued. It was just kind of like, man, you know, it'd be sucky for Peter if Vin died. Yeah... Then he'd have to find a new place to live, and, oh, that sucks. You know, I mean, it's just like, I have no emotional attachment to Vin whatsoever that him being put in this situation was nothing to me. Like, I just did not care at all about him. So, yeah. So there just wasn't any emotional investment there. It does seem like they're leading up into something with this, which is nice. I have a soft spot in my heart for the Kravenoffs and, and things that they do, so I'm hoping that this will go into something exciting. But in general, I mean, I, I did like this three-parter. It was overall better than most of Guggenheim's stuff, as long as he stays away from the humor. It's not that bad, but... Very briefly, I just want to talk about the story Birthday Boy from Brand New Day Extra Number 1. This is by Zeb Wells and Pat Olive. I have no idea where this appeared, but it's in this trade paperback at this point, so we're going to talk about it here, because it's stuff in new continuity, and it happens, and it's by one of the Brain Trust. 
it's excellent. It's like seven pages or something, and it's possibly the best story that they've come out with so far. It's the perfect hard luck hero thing with the do-rag. <laughs> Let me explain it first. Peter, like, is in the middle of a fight and he's trying to get to this birthday party for Harry. It's very much the same plot as Swing Shift, where Peter wants to get the uh, cake home to Aunt May and prove that he's, like, really responsible and stuff. This is him wanting to get to Harry's birthday party and prove he's really responsible and stuff. But of course, something happens, and because of the way he has to use his webbing, or maybe it's because he's fighting Pace Pot Pete, I can't remember what, but in any case, his mask gets stuck to his hair. I think it's his webbing because he's like, oh, it won't come out in an hour because they shove that down your throat repeatedly. So he has to tie it back as a do-rag and he goes to Harry's birthday with this stupid looking do-rag on his head being like, hey, what's up? And Harry's like, oh my God, you're an embarrassment. But, you know, Peter sticks up for Harry because all these people are like, oh, poor little rich boy with his neuroses and blah, 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 blah. And uh, like the last line, <laughs> is uh, Harry forgives Peter and they're leaving the party and Peter's like, yeah, we better get away fast. I stuffed mushrooms down that guy's pants and Harry's like, of course you did, Peter. Of course you did. And it's just, it's such a great little story. It showcases their friendship and what it should be. I love their friendship. Again, it's so Smallville because it's very, it, it's got that Lex Luthor, Clark Kent friendship that you know is going to crumble at some point and turn to ash, but you just, you want it to work so badly because you like both of the characters. So yeah, great story. Yeah, I don't know when Brand New Day Extra was published or anything like that, but it's included here, so we're talking about it. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Thank you very much for listening to Spider-Man Dissembled.